Right, so we're working on uh, grasp stability analysis, which is obviously very important for grasp planning. And what I'd like to share with you are our insights into this, this, the distinction between uh, active and passive reaction in robotic grasping. But really where I'd like to begin is uh, the foundational question of grasp stability analysis. That is, if we apply a wrench to an object inside a robotic grasp, will that grasp be able to resist it? And perhaps the most common approach to this problem still are the grasp wrench space methods uh, devised by uh, Carlo Ferrani and John Canny more than 20 years ago. And uh, what they do is they construct this convex hull of wrenches and argue that any wrench that is contained within this convex hull is resistible. And really what this, what this method answers is the question, are there legal contact wrenches that balance the required external wrench? And how large are they in relation to uh, this external disturbance? What we don't know, however, is how we can achieve those required contact wrenches. So um, if we were to use this kind of approach in practice, what would we have to know? And uh, the first thing is that we would have to know the resultant wrench at any given point in time, which means we need to have the inertial properties of the object, we have to have information about the trajectory of the object, and we need to know everything about any external wrench that is going to be applied to the object. And even if we had all this information, which is really hard to get by, we would then need to be able to uh, accurately regulate those required contact wrenches, which in some cases is impossible. So if you take, for example, the, the contact on the palm, there is no way we can actively regulate the contact wrench at that contact through uh, active joint torques. But even if we were able to do that, we would still have to be able to accurately regulate the joint torques, which is something that with most robotic hands we're just not able to do. So given all these limitations, what do people do in practice? Oh, sorry, actually, those last two points um, this is uh, kind of important. These last two points boil down to uh, the insight that these grass brain space methods do not take into account the kinematics of the hand. So looking at these kinematic, uh, or at these limitations, what do people do in, in practice to uh, create a grasp? And what they often do is they position the fingers around the object, and then they apply some fixed joint preload that they keep constant throughout the task and hope for the best. And it works, but why does it work? And it's because a grasp is able to resist applied wrenches passively, because the contact creates constraints to the object because the palm can't move and the joints don't back drive. So what we do is we look at grass stability from an inverse perspective. We want to know, given a fixed set of uh, commander torques to be applied at the, at the joints and an externally applied wrench, what is the net expected effect on the object, taking into account those passive reactions? So. Really what we need to solve is a problem of force distribution. That is, how is the externally applied wrench distributed to the contacts? And that's a problem that's generally statically indeterminate. That is, we can't just solve for those contact forces. What people have done in the past is they introduce virtual springs at the, at the contacts. So uh, an, an applied wrench will cause virtual object motion, which will cause deformation of those virtual springs, and that determines the contact forces. And this allows this solves the indeterminacy and allows us to just solve for the contact forces. But there's a problem with this. If you, if you consider this grasp here of a box in equilibrium inside a preloaded grasp, and you can see the contact wrenches here in the blue arrows inside the friction cones shown in red, and we apply a downwards wrench to the object, this causes virtual object motion downwards, causing uh, friction forces at the, at the distal contacts, and they have now forced the contact forces to lie outside of the friction cones. And that leads us to believe that this grasp should be unstable, but it's not. We know intuitively that we can push this box into the, into the hands, even without a preload, it should be able to resist passively. So where have we gone wrong? And the problem is that we've treated friction like a spring, and that's something that we argue you can't do. So we keep the virtual springs, but we only have them acting in the normal direction. So the friction forces are only constrained by the by the friction cones, they're not related to uh, virtual springs, which now also means that we can't just solve for, easily solve for contact forces anymore. But there's another problem. Say we apply an upwards wrench to this grasp, the same grasp. What's now happened is that the contact forces at the proximal links have become negative. And we know that's not possible because a contact can only push, it can't pull. So what this forces us to do is to, consi to consider a contact to be in one of two states. 
a contact is either attached, in which case the contact force can lie anywhere within the friction cone, and the normal component of the force is uh, determined by the compression of the virtual spring, or it's detached, in which case the contact force has to be zero. And this is something that we can, that we can cast as a mixed integer problem, and uh, that uh, allows us to deal with this combinatorial issue that uh, uh, these contacts introduce to a problem. And we face a very similar issue with the joints. If we push an object against a finger with non back drivable joints, then what we expect is that the contact force at that finger will increase, and that the additional joint torque is absorbed by the mechanical structure of the finger. At the other finger, however, the contact force can't decrease because we've set constant joint preloads at the beginning of the task that are keep keeping constant throughout the task. So now this, fill this, this, follow this uh, finger must follow the object, so to speak, in order to keep the contact force and therefore the joint torque constant at the level that we've commanded. So again, the joints as well have to be modeled in one of two states. Either it's locked because we're pushing against it or it's following to keep the joint torque constant. So now we have three complex relationships in our model. The first one being that the friction is uh, not linearly related to virtual object motion. Uh, it's only constrained to lie within the friction cones. And um, the other issue is that both contacts and joints are modeled to be in one of two states, which means we have to cast this as a mixed integer problem. So how do we go about solving this? The, the primitive solution to this might be to just feed this to a mixed integer problem solver with an objective such as to minimize the energy stored in the, in the virtual springs, which makes physical sense. But we've found in practice that this is insufficient because the solver finds ways to unnaturally move the object to wedge it between the non back travel fingers, creating large contact forces, and uh, that then leads to uh, resistance to arbitrary wrenches, which is, of course, unphysical. So what we do to solve this is we introduce an iterative solution method where we restrict the virtual object motion to lie only in the, only in the direction of the net unbalanced wrench acting on the object. But now the solver is often not capable of, of completely eliminating this, uh, this uh, resultant wrench to zero in a single step. So if it's not able to do that, what we do is we minimize this net resultant wrench, and if it's not zero, we iterate again, take the next step, and now the object is only allowed to move in the direction of this new uh, resultant wrench. And we keep doing this until the problem converges, and if it converges to a zero residual, then we deem the cross stable, otherwise we deem it to be unstable. And this gives us uh, results that are much more uh, physically intuitive. So I'd like to show you, you two example grasps that kind of showcase uh, the behavior that our framework is able to, to predict. And the first one is uh, the same grasp as before. It's a box within a preloaded grasp. And as expected, the minimum resi resistible wrench is, uh, by the way, the resistible wrenches are shaded in blue, and that's what our framework pr predicts, is just pulling the object upwards out of the grasp. And note that to be able to resist this wrench, you need a preload. If there is no preload, you won't be able to resist that wrench. But interestingly, if you also apply sideways force to push the object against the finger, then that also increases the, the resistance to uh, upwards wrenches applied to the same box. There are also directions in which you can push the object and the hand will be able to react arbitrary magnitude wrenches even without a preload passively. And these are things that grasp range space methods won't, won't show you because um, you can see the convex hull here in green. You won't, you won't be able to tell from that that due to passive reactions, pushing the object sideways increases react, uh, uh, wrench resistance to upwards wrenches. And you won't be able to tell that there are directions which you can push with arbitrary magnitude and the grasp is able to resist, resist that passively without any preload. The second example is a 3D grasp, and uh, the reason I'd like to show you this is that we found if you, if you preload only a single finger, that can have large effects on the envelope of um, resistible wrenches that this uh, grasp can react. And you can see that here in, in blue and red are the, the, the two envelopes uh, for either preloading just finger one or just finger two, and uh, they're very, very different. So really the takeaway from this is that uh, the kinematics of the hand profoundly affects grasp stability, and that the envelope of resistible wrenches is also largely dependent on which joints you choose to preload. The dirty laundry. 
our iterative approach isn't guaranteed to converge. And if it does converge, it's not guaranteed to converge to, this, to a physically meaningful solution. And the second thing is, and this is something we found during experiments, uh, we're not modeling uncertainties, and we found that even small differences in contact location can make they can have large effects on the stability of the grasp. So in the future, what we'd like to do is to uh, characterize the, um, the effect of these uncertainties and uh, see how the model and the experiment react to uh, unknown contact locations and, or, say, uncertainties in, in friction coefficient. But the big limitation really is the computational cost. And what it does is that it limits us to point queries. We can only check individual wrenches because each one of those spot checks takes off the order of a few seconds. So if you were to sample in six-dimensional space, it's just uh, computationally prohibitively expensive, and we're not able to do that yet. And with that, all that's left for me to do is thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions. First question from Christopher Foros. Hello. Congratulations on your work. Um, I, you sort of addressed that in your laundry slide, but um, I was wondering about the assumption on the friction coefficient and how this uh, affects the performance of your method. And also, um, in your method, you make use of several, you introduce several parameters um, to to get an answer on whether on the grasp stability. And so my second question has to do with how transferable those parameters are to different graphs and different problems. Right. So as I said, something we'd like to do in the future is to have a look at the sensitivity, both of our model and of the real experiment, to uh, uncertainties in, for example, friction coefficient. And we found in experiments, uh, and just trying to, to and when we tried getting experimental validation, we found that these kind of uncertainties do actually have a large effect. So this is something for future work. And um, the second thing, I believe, how transferable insights are from one grasp to the next. So um, I suppose because this is so computationally uh, prohibitively uh, expensive, we only check individual grasps. But the insights, they are transferable. So the insight that uh, the preload matters, I believe, uh, doesn't just apply to a single grasp, but that applies to the whole family of uh, multi-fingered robotic hands. Sorry, I, I missed something really fundamental. Are you, are you f allowing the fingers to actually move in the sense that you're, are you doing sort of a, a longer term dynamic analysis of the grasp? Or is it really, as soon as they move, you've considered that grasp unsuccessful? It's all quasi-static. So all quasi there is no, the, I, I suppose it, it has some features of a dynamics engine, so to speak, because it, it does have the, the, um, the sorry, the state-wise, uh, um, model of the contact to be either attached or detached, but it's all quasi static. So what we're really doing is we're only con concerning, we're only considering virtual object motion and virtual joint motion, and uh, then feeding that problem to a mixed integer problem solver to see if it finds a solution. You one more question while we're setting up. Um, um. Hello. Yes. Um, so you mentioned a couple of times being more physically meaningful. I just wanted to ask what do you mean by that? Do you have a baseline to compare against, or how do you evaluate that? I'm not sure I understand. Uh, so you've mentioned a couple of times the results that you get, that you observe being more physically meaningful. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, so uh, I just so, wanted to see if you have any uh, baseline to compare against, or how do you evaluate that? We did exper experiments to validate, but also it was very, you could you could tell in our initial experiments that the object would move virtually in directions that you wouldn't expect, and you could see that the, what the solver was doing is that it was trying to wedge the object between non-backdrawable fingers, creating large large contact forces, and that is something we saw as unphysical because uh, experiments didn't show that either. And then we tried fixing that with. Uh, taking into account energy constraints and all sorts of things. And what worked for us in the end is that iterative approach, which gave results that uh, not only looked way more intuitive, but also were validated by, by our experiments. <laughs>